population distribution and population density. That is what you're here to learn. And if I do say so myself, it's pretty tasty. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, well, let's get to it. And as is proper, let's begin with a definition. Population distribution refers to the patterns of human habitation across the Earth's surface. In other words, why do people live where they live? And that might not sound like an interesting question until you realize that all 8 billion humans on this planet live on only 5% of the Earth's surface. <laughs> What? I mean, to be fair, a lot of the Earth's surface is water, and until we can evolve into mer people, living there is off the table. But still, it's pretty astonishing. So we'll just consider population distribution where people actually live, which is what we call the ecumene. And then to further blow your mind, if we only look at the ecumene, almost two thirds of the world's population lives in these four population clusters. You got South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Europe. So the question is, why? Why is the Earth's population distributed in this way and not some other way? And before I answer that, let me just mention that if you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam in May, then you might want to check out my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide. It's got whole unit reviews that you won't find here on YouTube. It's got note guides to follow along, practice questions, practice exams, and answer keys for all of it. So, you know, if that's something you're into, check it out. Okay, there are basically two factors that determine how populations are distributed. First, you've got physical factors. Under this heading, climate plays a big role in where people live. Now, remember, climate and weather are not the same thing. Weather is what's happening today. You know, it's sunny, it's raining, there's a tornado, whatever. But climate describes weather patterns over long periods of time. So in terms of population distribution, humans love the mid-latitudes between 30 and 60 degrees from the equator because that's where climate is milder with a decent amount of precipitation. Or to get even more specific, it's because of climate patterns that North American populations mostly live here where it's warm and not up here where, as we say in the South, it is colder than a brass toilet seat on the shady side of an iceberg. But also landforms are another physical factor that affects distribution. Humans generally like to live in lowland areas because it's in those areas that it's easier to build and it's easier to farm. Like, you know, humans can't exactly flourish at the tops of mountains. <gasps> it's, it's hard to breathe up here. Can, can you breathe? However, I should mention that in regions near the equator, mountainous regions can be highly populated precisely because the higher elevations can be cooler and more temperate. And then water is another physical factor that affects distribution. You see, for most of human history, populations clustered around bodies of water like rivers and coastal areas. And that's not hard to understand, right? Like without water, you're dead. But also living near water means access to trading routes, many of which have existed in the water from time immemorial. For example, you can see most of the populations in Eurasia and Australia and South America live around the coastal areas and not so much in the interior where water is more scarce and the climate is pretty extreme. Okay, now the second set of factors that affect population distribution are human factors. And under this heading, we could consider culture. What I mean is populations can be found in greater concentrations where cultural amenities like education and healthcare are more accessible. Also, we can consider economics under this heading. Like people tend to settle where they're confident that they can make a living, like where resources and jobs are abundant. If there are a lot of jobs in a place, more people tend to live there. And if there are less jobs, less people tend to live there. Okay, also history falls under human factors. That means that where populations were distributed in the past can have a strong influence on where they exist in the present. For example, once a major city like Paris or Beijing or New York is settled and built up, populations tend to remain in those places for a long time. And then finally, politics is another human factor that affects population distribution. People may choose to move because they don't like the political policies in their home country while they find policies in another country more attractive. Or in other cases, decisions by political leaders can change the distribution. For example, in the mid 20th century, leaders in the Soviet Union forcibly moved thousands of Russians from the more populated Western areas to the sparsely populated and butt cold Siberian region in order to extract natural resources in the area. Okay, now that you understand the factors that influence population distribution, let me further burden your brain and mention that these factors actually vary according to different scales of analysis. What I mean is at a global scale, it's usually climate and access to water that explains distribution. But at a more local scale, distribution might be better explained by land forms like say, you know, the Rocky Mountains, which push populations to settle here and not here. Okay, now that you understand the basics of population distribution, let's turn the corner and talk about population density, which is the measure of how many people occupy a given unit of land. Now don't get confused, population distribution illustrates where populations exist while density tells us how many people live in those places. So if you have one square mile and one person that lives there, that's a density of one person per square mile. But if you have 10 people living there, the density is 10 people per square mile. Easy peasy mac and cheesy. But let me give you a better example I learned from geographer Jeff Gibson over at Geography by Jeff, and it's kind of mind-blowing. What he says is that if we get the density right, every human being on the planet could live in a city the size of Texas. So let's see how that works by looking at two cities and their population densities, namely Houston and New York. So the population density of Houston is about 3,500 people per square mile, which is relatively low as far as cities go. And that's because Houston has a dense downtown area, but mostly people live in houses like this. But New York has a density of about 29,000 people per square mile 
and so we're getting much denser. Much of the housing there has people stacked up to the sky and that's why they can fit so many people there. Okay, now here it is, are you ready? If we took every person on the planet and shoved them into a city with Houston's density numbers, that city would take up much of the United States. But if we constructed that city according to the density numbers of New York, then it would be a Texas-sized city. Like all these eight billion people living in this tiny place, like, oh, that is the power of population density. All right, now I know that you, like me, are having prodigious amounts of fun thinking about population density, but we have to move on because you also need to know how it is calculated, and there are three ways that you need to know. First is arithmetic density, which is the total population divided by the total land area. And that's what we did with our one square mile example. 10 people, one square mile equals 10 people per square mile. Now, arithmetic density is useful in a lot of ways, but where it falls short is that it assumes that all the land in an area is equally inhabitable, but in real life, that is not really how it is. For example, Taiwan has one of the highest population densities in the world, but three quarters of its people live on one third of its land area. And so arithmetic density doesn't really account for this, and the number might lead you to assume that the population is evenly distributed across Taiwan, but it is not. So that leads us to the second way to calculate population density, namely physiological density, which is the total population divided by the total amount of arable land. And what in the fresh heck is arable land? Well, it's land that can be used for agriculture. So then this measurement is good for demonstrating how well a population is able to feed itself. So here we've got 10 people per square mile, and that's our arithmetic density. But suppose in this square mile, half the land is suitable for farming. That would be 10 divided by 0.5, which would give us 20 people per square mile. Or what if only a quarter of the land could grow food? Well, then we have a physiological density of 40 people per square mile. So the point is, the higher the physiological density, the more pressure will be put on farmland to produce enough food. And then the lower the number, the more likely this piece of land will produce enough food to stuff in everyone's mouth holes. And finally, the third calculation you need to know is agricultural density, which is the total farmers divided by total arable land. And this measure helps geographers understand how labor intensive agriculture is in a given place. So here, a lower number means less farmers growing food, which in turn typically means more mechanization on farms. But a high number usually means that many farmers are subsistence farmers growing only what they need to survive and not selling their goods on the market for others to eat. And so the thing to remember about these various calculations is that each one helps geographers get the whole picture of human impact on environments in which they live. All right, click here to keep reviewing my other unit two videos and click here to grab my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a five on your exam in May. And I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.